Okay. <laughs> that would be better. Um, so um, I'm coming from Serraj Lab in Action Provence, in the south of France. And um, my presentation will deal about uh, the physical chemical behavior of nanoparticles in the, in the water column, about the, the dispersion stability of the nanoparticles. Um, I would, uh, so this is related to the exposure assessment of nano, of course. Um, and I would like to introduce you in my presentation a new program that I am coordinate that I would be coordinating that is just that will start in next up April, and uh, so the name is uh, Nanoeater, and it's funded by the Iranet Sin uh, Call. Uh, in this program, uh, so this program is focused on the on the assessment of the dispersion stability of the nanoparticles in the water column. Um, so. On this scheme, I tried to figure the different parameters that we consider when uh, assessing the, the exposure aspect of nanoparticle to living organisms. Um, so my presentation will deal mainly about the, the, the physical chemistry of the solution, like pH and ionic strengths, and about the interaction of nanoparticles with naturally occurring suspended matter. Uh, I will not talk about um, transfer in power system or behavior in through water, tr uh, water treatment, plan treatment plants. Um, but first of all, uh, before talking about dispersion stability, talking about uh, dispersibility, I would like to raise uh, a first key parameter that, uh, that is um, the surface properties of the nanoparticles. And this is re related to the life cycle, actually, of the nanoparticles. If we consider the life cycle of, the, of a nanoproduct, uh, starting from the mining extraction, there is a nanoparticle production, then functionalization and synthesis of nano, nano pro products, materials, and finally the, the nano product commercialized um, and ending by the end of life or the, or the recycling of the product. At each step of this life cycle, uh, there is a poten potential source of release into the environment of nanoparticles. But what I want to mention here is that the properties, the surface properties of the nanoparticles will differ at each step, starting from pristine nanoparticles, then they will be coated and, or in, embedded in a matrix, and fi finally it will be uh, more some residues of alteration of nanoproducts that will be released. So to illustrate uh, this um, consideration, uh, on this slide I put the example of the titanium di dioxide nanoparticle used in sunscreens. There are four different formulations of titanium dioxide. Um, the first example is a, is a pure TiO2 nanoparticles uh, that disperses pretty well in, in water, I, despite the, the fact that very often the, the measured size by DLS is larger than the expected size announced by the manufacturer, but this is certainly due to the presence of dense cluster not dissociable. The second example, uh, the Two, the number two and number three examples consist of nano nano material uh, consisting of uh, TiO2 nanoparticles uh, functionalized by a dispersing agent. This one is uh, the first one is a hydrophilic dispersing agent because these nanomaterials are aimed at being dispersed in the water phase of the sunscreen. And the second one is a hydrophobic um, dispersing agent because this product is aimed at being dispersed in the oil phase of the cream. So, uh, respectively, these are polyacrylate and PDMS uh, coatings. Of course, the hydrophilic uh, nanomaterial g gives uh, an easy dispersion in pure water, while uh, the hydrophobic uh, nanomaterial, as expected, will show a totally different behavior, giving a very, very polydispersed uh, size distribution, not, any, not anymore measured by DLS because this is not compatible with some very large aggregates, hydrophobic aggregates that are, that are observed here. But what we can notice here is that be, below one micrometer, a long time of uh, stirring in pure water, there is an increase in the proportion of, of sub-micronic particles. Sorry. Um, so, and this is a particularly interesting uh, size fraction since it, uh, it corresponds to the particles that are stable in suspension. And the last sample consists of a, uh, a global sunscreen just uh, bought on a in a supermarket that show something very similar uh, with uh, initially large uh, size and, uh, of hydrophobic material which with time 
tends to disperse more, more and more in the submicronic size fraction. Uh, so I know that my colleague uh, Jerome Rose will talk a little bit more about this, uh, this behavior cons uh, and the mechanisms of alteration that are behind uh, this, uh, this observation. What I, want, what I would like to focus on me, uh, concerns more the dispersion stability of these nanoparticles once dispersed in water. Uh, so, to characterize these different dispersions of nanoparticles, typically we, we can measure the zeta potential versus the, versus the pH of the solution. Uh, the, the, there are two advantages in doing this measurement. Uh, first, um, uh, you, well, you, can measure, you can get a, a, a pH of zero zeta potential called the isoelectric point, which indicates you the chemistry of the surface of the nanoparticles. Typically, with pure TiO2 nanoparticles, there is an IEP around six, uh, while the aged hydrophobic um, nanomaterial uh, gives uh, an IEP around seven, which is actually due, due to a surface after alteration of aluminum oxide. Uh, and uh, as a comparison, uh, the, the hydrophilic um, nanomaterial and the sunscreen, which are uh, for, for which the, the, this, the surface charge is mainly driven by the organic groups, uh, gives some IEP very low. So, and the second advantage of measuring this is uh, expecting, predicting the, the colloidal, the dispersion stability of these systems in water. Uh, because uh, IEP means pH around which the nanoparticle will, will aggregate. So typically we can expect that these two samples will have a low stability compared to the two other ones. Uh, so what we can do to measure uh, the, the, color, the dispersion stability of the nanoparticles, this is a typical approach that I, want, that I present you first, uh, is just measuring the kinetics of aggregation by dynamic light scattering. For example, when you increase the salt concentration, uh, you, you get a critical coagulation, you a critical salt concentration above which nanoparticles aggregate together, and by plotting these kinetics normalized to the fastest kinetic, you, you can determine a stability ratio that gives you this critical coagulation concentration. Okay, this is a well-known phenomenon. Well, now, we, we can also uh, complexify a little bit more the composition of the system by introducing some natural organic matter and doing the same kind of measurement. Uh, so this is just the final size uh, plotted here as a function of the salt concentration. And in the presence of different uh, NOM, um, that are anionic polysaccharides, neutral polysaccharides uh, here, and humic and tannic acids. And as you can see, well, this is also a well-known phenomenon. The presence of natural organic matter very often uh, favors the dispersion stability of the nanoparticles. Since, since at, even at high salt concentration, we are measuring a very, uh, especially in the presence of tannic acid and humic acid, we, we still have some pretty well dispersed system. So, due to the stabilization of the nanoparticles by the adsorbing NOM. Uh, so, this is a typical uh, approach for measuring the dispersion stability of nanoparticles. Uh, and what I want to mention here is the limitation of such an approach due to the solid concentration that was used for these experiments. Typically, to get a, an easily measurable uh, data by dynamic light scattering, we have to work with concentration about uh, 10 to 100 milligram per liter, which is not relevant at all considering the, 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 the scenarios of uh, release of uh, nanoparticles in the environment that, that, that are proposed uh, now and which uh, rather, rather predict some concentrations in the range of microgram per liter. Uh, so what is the consequence of such an overestimation of the, of the working concentration? Well, from one hand, uh, the, the critical coagulation concentration is not is not changed at, at all, but if we consider the mechanism of aggregation, uh, if you let me reintroduce this very old theory uh, of Franz Moliszewski, which says that the aggregation mechanism consists simply in two steps. The first step of transport of the particle until they, they meet e each other, uh, and the second step of sticking, the sticking reaction of the colliding particle. Um, we can write, uh, this kind of model equation uh, depicting, depicting the, um, these two uh, key uh, steps uh, where, so, so you have just the, in this equation, the evolution, the kinetics, 
the evolution versus time of the number of particles of si size k uh, produced by the collision of nanoparticle i with particle j, um, well, and, and a further step of k decreasing when k meets uh, another more particle. Uh, so there are two key factors in this equation, actually. There is a sticking effic efficiency, which is related to the second step, uh, and which is actually just the inverse value of the stability ratio that we measured in the previous slide, so we can measure it easily. And there is a collision frequency. And this is a, a critical value that I wanted to, to focus on in my talk, because we often neglect this, this point but uh, considering the solid concentration, the concentration of the nanoparticle, this uh, beta, this collision frequency value becomes very critical. Uh, actually, it can be calculated because this fre collision frequency just be, uh, in, is driven by the Brown Brownian motion. Uh, that this is a, the, the agitation of the system. So there is Brownian motion and there is mechanical steering. So we can calculate this easily. There is temperature, viscosity, uh, and shear, uh, shearing in the system, mechanical shearing. And in the end, we can uh, calculate um, a time required for, non for particles to collide together in a certain extent, uh, considering an initial nanoparticle concentration and a final concentration. Uh, we can plot, that's what I did here, the, the time required to collide 10% of particles and 90% of particles. This is in red and blue. And I plotted this as a function of the con solid concentration of, of particles. So as expected, when you dilute the system, you, in you increase the, the time required to collide the particles together. And if, you, if we compare the two key concentrations that we are considering, for example, 10 mi milligram per liter that we are working with, uh, the, the collision time falls in the range of one hour. That's typically what we observe when we make some aggregation kinetics measurement. But now if we consider a more relevant solid concentration, uh, as you can see, we fall rather in a, in a time range of 100 hours. 100 hours are required to collide the nanoparticles together. So this collision frequency becomes a very critical parameter. And in a such a long time, we can easily imagine that nanoparticle will have uh, time to collide with uh, many other components that are present in higher concentration in the, in the system. I mean, the naturally occurring colloids. And then the, the question becomes, what about the, the collision, the sticking efficiency between nanoparticles and natural, naturally occurring colloids? So this is typically the, the, the aim of the, this program, NanoEater, that will start soon. Um, here I present you the final aim of, the, of this program, which is um, predicting the f um, some scenarios for, uh, for the fate of nanoparticles uh, in, a in a typical surface water. So for this purpose, there is a group of um, Martin Scheringer in ETH, ETH in Switzerland who uh, uh, developed uh, this fate model uh, scaled at the kilometer scale, uh, at the river scale actually. Uh, for this purpose, they uh, just cut the, the river the Rhine River, it w they published this work recently, they cut the, the river in many boxes along the length axis and also along the vertical axis of the river. And in each of these boxes, they tried, so as in, in the long vertical axis, you, you can distinguish moving water and sediment and interface between both. And they tried to, so the, the principle of the model is just to quantify the amount of nanoparticle in each of these box along both axes. And for this purpose, they try to, well, we try to consider the different mechanisms uh, that nanoparticle may undergo, uh, considering homo aggregation, that's when nanoparticles aggregate together, and hetero aggregation, that's when they aggregate with natural, natural colloids. And of course, the sedimentation process that occurs as a function of the size obtained by the aggregates and of the hydrodynamic shearing. Um, so there is an unknown parameter to, to feed such a model. This is the st this uh, sticking efficiency between the natural colloids and the nanoparticles. And we developed uh, an experiment in, in our lab in Serej to try to measure this uh, sticking efficiency. This, uh, this uh, experiment is, uh, is based on laser diffraction, uh, so which gives a, a measure measurable size range from uh, 10 nanometers to millimeter scale. Um, 
and so here you can see the principle there is um, in a in a stirred reactor there are some colloids uh, at 100 milligram per liter um, dispersed in, a, in an electrolyte just made of salt and controlled pH and this suspension is made circulated through the measuring cell thanks to a pump and then recir recirculated recycled in the in the beaker and versus time we can measure the size distribution uh, every three seconds it's a very rapid measurement and at time zero what we are doing is introducing a certain amount of nanoparticles in a re in a relevant uh, concentration uh, which is below one milligram per liter uh, so typically the the expected scen uh, scenario will be um, in this first case uh, we, we we use the very, uh, some very simple conditions, which are pH 5. And at, in these conditions, you have the titanium dioxide nanoparticles, which are positively charged, while the silica, mm, silica particles, which are used as colloids, uh, which are 0.5 micrometer, uh, are negatively charged. So we expect a very high affinity between both particles. Uh, and what we want to potentially measure is this kind of heteroaggregation. So Let's see what it gives when we plot the, the evolution versus time of the median, si median size uh, of, the, of the particles or, or of the aggregates um, here in, in green uh, when we add 0.5 milligram per liter of nanoparticles. Uh, actually, nothing happens. As you can see, we, we, we remain at 0.5 micrometer, which is the size of the, of the silica particles. I forgot to mention that, of course, at, a, at this concentration of nanoparticles and this size, this apparatus is just blind uh, regarding the nanoparticles. We never, we are never able to measure them, even if they absorb at the, at the surface of the colloids. There's no evolution of the of in the in the size measure. But now let's look at what happens when we increase the, the concentration of nanoparticles at 0.8, so which is not so far from 0.5 actually. But this is typically the critical concentration of nanoparticles that we that we found because we measured a, very, a huge hetero aggregation of the system in that case um, we also developed a model that enables us to calculate the, the, the sticking efficiency uh, of the colloids together uh, and which tells us that the um, sticking this alpha value here is about 0.5 and it's interesting to compare this value to the highest values that we could measure in the case of homo aggregation of the silica particles, just induced by sodium chloride uh, addition. In these cases, there was no salt. Here, there is just only silica particles and plus salt added at time zero. And this highest kinetic that we could measure uh, actually is, uh, gives a, an alpha value two, two times lower than the, the value obtained in the case of heteroaggregation. So what we can see here is that nanoparticles favor the aggregation of the natural colloids uh, in a kinetics uh, even larger uh, than what can be obtained uh, in absence of nanoparticles and in absence of salt. I think, yeah, a, a last uh, quantitative uh, consideration. If you, uh, 0.8 milligram per liter corresponds to a surface ratio of 2.4 uh, percent, so which is very low. This critical Nanoparticle concentration for hetero aggregation uh, falls in the, in the well, in this very narrow window, which is uh, around 2.4 percent of surface coverage of the colloids. Now, if we complexify a little, just a little bit, the, the system by using a more relevant pH, um, which, what was done here. So, in that case, uh, the titanium dioxide will uh, so pH 8, uh, titanium dioxide will be negatively charged. So there is no strong affinity expected between nanoparticles and colloids. And indeed, uh, in absence of salt, nothing happens. Uh, with 0.8 milligram per liter of nanoparticles, nothing happens this time. Because, of course, nanoparticles are very negatively charged, according to the zeta potential measured. However, if we increase the salt concentration in the system, as we did here, um, we get a critical salt concentration that enables that strains the, the surface electric potential of the nanoparticles. As you can see, we can reach minus 20 millivolt in the end. Uh, so the salt screens the, the, the electrostatic operations between nanoparticles and colloids. And finally, 
uh, enables the, the heteroaggregation mechanism. Now, as a last step, to complexify uh, just a little bit more, but I forgot to mention that these are some preliminary data that, are, that I am presenting. Um, in the last uh, consideration, we added uh, some natural organic matter. This is uh, a humic acid added here, and uh, you can compare the green plots. Uh, so there is still some 0.8 milligram per liter of nanoparticles, and when we uh, here it's in the absence of uh, humic acid, and when we increase the concentration of humic acid, we redisperse the system, because as we can expect, the, the organic molecule absorb at the surface of the of the nanoparticles and prevent the heteroaggregation, well, induce a higher um, ne negative surface charge. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm going very fast. Uh, uh, this is uh, the same kind of experiment that we carried with uh, uh, using clay this time instead of, the, of silica particles. And it's, of course, even more compli complex because clay don't, don't display a homogeneous surface charge. There is uh, as, uh, positive and negative so, uh, groups at the surface of clay sheets. So what we, what we observed is that uh, here, in absence of salt, uh, heteroaggregation at pH 8 occurred uh, with uh, the same amount of nanoparticles. And in the present, in the addition of salt, uh, added here at time zero, and nanoparticles were added at this time here, finally the same size of heteroaggregates are ob uh, is obtained. Ob obtained. Um, now, uh, if we complexify again the system by adding some humic acid uh, in the system, in the absence of salt this time, there is no nanoparticle induced heteroaggregation observed in green. However, in the presence of salt, which was added first, then humic acid was added, and then nanoparticle were added. Uh, as you can see, the, the, there is really a, a balance between the opposite tendencies of dispersion and, and aggregation. Okay, I'm coming to the, the, the conclusion of my, my presentation. Uh, by just by presenting you the different tasks of the of the this this program nano eater uh, i presented the, the the model aspect of the of the program of the project we um, which is the final aim uh, to feed this model uh, approach uh, so in serage lab we will carry many experiments regarding uh, so heteroaggregation measured by laser diffraction and also some uh, quantify the interactions between the different components. But what I want to mention is that also in a parallel way, um, the, I, I, I did not mention actually the, wha what kind of, nanomater of material we will use as nanoparticles and as natural colloids. So for this purpose, we will also character use some natural water from, from a river, from the Rhone River, for example, that we will characterize in terms of natural organic matter and mineral suspended. Uh, and we and we will spike such water with nanoparticles in order to to validate the the, the, the model the, the synthetic approach carried here. Uh, so we are four partners. I want to mention here that there are three job positions open uh, in the frame of this program. Uh, and I'm coming to my last slide to thank my my colleagues in Ceres working with me in uh, uh, on the on nano and environment, and, I, and I'm finishing by this advertisement. Since we are organizing on next summer the, this yearly international conference on the environmental and effects on, of nanoparticles and nanomaterials, uh, we will host, we will be proud to host this event in Aix-en-Provence, so you are welcome to submit your abstract on this website. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sharon, for this very exciting presentation and uh, to give us a short outlook of uh, how complex things may become in real world systems. So thank you again. We may have uh, only one question, which, yeah. Uh, it was an excellent presentation. And I'm wondering more about your EPS studies. Um, you defined EPS, I think, by anionic side chains, so they were polysaccharides. Yeah. Um, are you also, so what was the source of the EPS? And did, it, uh, did you also consider inclusion of nucleic acids and proteins? And then are you looking no. at EPS in terms of heteroaggregation as well? Uh, actually, these EPS were just pure polysaccharides from bacterial origin. Um, we, we are collaborating with uh, some biochemists from working on the resource firm on this project. So they can isolate the, 
the, the EPS, uh, where the, the bacteria producing the EPS, and they were, they were previously ca largely characterized in terms of molecular weight of chemical structure, the, these macromolecules. So, and we can also modify them in, uh, by removing some acidic group or something like that. So the idea is uh, indeed to to compare the well, the different structures of macromolecules uh, and look at the the effect on the heteroagregation process. Yeah. The, so these are pure macromolecules. Hi, Jerome. Very nice. Uh, I was just wondering if you mentioned about extrapolation from the silica to other nanomaterials because you mentioned modeling. So are you going to use that uh, information that from your experiments to extrapolate to other? Conditions. Excuse me, I didn't catch. Extrapolate what? To wider conditions to other particles, other materials. Are you considering that in your modeling? Can you say it again, please? So you're going to do experiments on with specific nanomaterials? Yes. And are you going to be able to, via modeling, to extrapolate to a wider range of, of other materials with, with other properties? Ah, true. Oh, um to write a model to extrapolate to other nanomaterials. No, I was more uh, thinking about working with different kinds of nanomaterials as I presented in the introduction, comparing yeah. different functionalizations of uh, nanoparticles with same uh, hurt chemistry, like TiO2, for example. Uh, but no, I didn't think about extrapolating a model form the speciation of the nano. Well, I, I know this would be very difficult to do, but uh, yeah. it's something that uh, obviously you know, we would aim to have in the future. You know, not only just the receiving environment being different, but actually trying to, you know, people talk about the groupings and so on. So if you can kind of uh, think about groupings and see, do, will they behave similarly or not in, in specific conditions, I guess. This is what I was aiming for. Oh, yeah. But mm -hmm. it's quite ambitious, well, I know. But, you know, we need to do kind of small steps, I guess. However, we can imagine to categorize the different kinds of functionalization, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, negatively charged, or positively charged. Well, uh, yeah, we, so <laughs> this, yeah, in, this, in this way, we, we could imagine to, yeah, to categorize the, the main behaviors by comparing, that, that was the idea indeed, uh, comparing positively charged, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, yeah. Okay, thank you once again, Jerome. Uh, we are a bit short in time. We continue with the next 